You know what we love to talk about on this channel. Incredible archaeological finds. The joy of being interested in archaeology is that there's always something new to talk about, and always something new to learn. We've learned about some fantastic archaeological discoveries recently, and we're excited to share them with you. Let's get started. Let's start by talking about an entire ancient city. We're embarking on a 6,000-year journey through time to the ancient city of Susa, located in present-day Iran. This city, composed of three tells, the Acropolis, the Royal City, and the Apadana, has seen the rise and fall of empires. From its origins as a village around 4200 BCE, to its zenith as the capital of the Elamite Kingdom and the Achaemenid Persian Empire, Susa's fortunes waxed and waned with military victories and devastating sacks, such as those by Nebuchadnezzar I and Ashurbanipal. The city's grandeur is evident in the palaces of Darius I and Artaxerxes II, although signs of dense population are scarce. Susa's star dimmed after Alexander the Great's conquest, and it passed into the hands of Seleucus I. The city saw periods of prosperity under the Parthians and the Sasanians, marked by the growth of residential areas and the emergence of a Christian community. The Arab conquest in the 7th century brought Islam to Susa, leading to another period of prosperity before its eventual decline. So, as we explore the ruins of Susa, we're not just uncovering stones and artifacts, but the ebb and flow of human civilization itself. Next on the agenda, we have the Kupt Minar complex in Mirali, India. There are countless important ancient monuments within the complex, including the famous Iron Pillar of Delhi, which never rusts. The most famous monument at the site is the Victory Tower, named for the religious icon Sufi Saint Kwaja Kutbuddin Bakhtiar Kaki, who was a mystic and scholar of the 12th century. The tower took almost 200 years to build, with work completed in 1368. For several centuries, it was traditional for the rulers who controlled the area to add monuments of their own to the complex. Even the Brits added a few buildings during the time of the British Raj. Aside from the Iron Pillar and the Victory Tower, other structures of note at the Kutub Minar complex include the Alai Darwaza Gate, the Alai Minar, and the Kuwat ul Islam Mosque, which was assembled from the broken remains of no fewer than 27 former Hindu and Jian temples. The entire complex now belongs to the Indian National Trust for Art and Cultural Heritage, which restores and maintains as many monuments as it can, and also arranges the annual Kutub Festival of Music and Art. A discovery made by a human metal detectorist is one thing. A discovery made by a badger is quite another. This story sounds too absurd to be true, and yet it happened. In January 2022, a hungry badger was directly responsible for unearthing the biggest collection of Roman coins ever to be found in northern Spain. While searching for berries and worms to eat in Grado Asturias, the badger opened up a crack in the ground close to its den, and the coins started flowing out. Unsurprisingly, the badger had no need for the coins, it left them where they spilt out into the ground, and they were discovered shortly afterwards by two archaeologists on a routine visit to the area. The coins were all minted between the 3rd and 5th centuries. While the denominations are Roman, the coins were minted in places as far afield as Greece and Turkey. They didn't get into the ground by accident, so it's likely that someone buried them more than 1,600 years ago as a way of keeping them safe. Whoever that person was, they never came back for their life savings. Ah, but the badger did. In a discovery that's shaking up our understanding of the spread of Neolithic culture, archaeologists have unearthed a complex of early Neolithic monuments at Dorston Hill in Herefordshire, England. These structures, dating back at least 5,800 years, make Dorston Hill the earliest culturally Neolithic site in the West Midlands of England. This finding challenges the theory that Neolithic practices spread evenly from southeast to northwest across Britain. Instead, it suggests that the spread was somewhat irregular, with pockets of hunter-gatherers and farmers sometimes coexisting for hundreds of years. 
The use of advanced statistical methods and radiocarbon dating revealed that almost all phases of occupation at Dorstone Hill were earlier than expected, with the earliest occupation probably going back further than 3800 BC. This discovery could have dramatic implications for our understanding of Britain's first farmers, suggesting that their spread across the island was uneven and messy, marked by areas of precious change, time lags, and diverse relationships with indigenous hunter-gatherers. As much as we think of our most distant ancestors as very simple people, it seems they and their people led lives just as complicated as ours in their own way. Cameo glass, a luxury form of glass art, is an exquisite testament to the ingenuity and creativity of ancient artisans. This technique, which involves engraving or etching and carving through fused layers of different colored glass to produce designs, was first seen in ancient Roman art around 30 BCE. The most famous example of Roman cameo glass is the Portland vase, housed in the British Museum. Cameo glass was produced in two periods, the early period from about 30 BC to 60 CE, and then from the late 3rd century to the period of Constantine the Great and his sons. After that, the technique was lost until the 18th century in Europe, and not perfected again until the 19th century. The Art Nouveau period saw the most notable work since the revival, with makers such as Émile Gall and Duom of Nancy abandoning Roman-inspired subjects and color schemes for plant and flower designs. Today, cameo glass continues to be produced, reminding us of the timeless allure of this intricate art form. If we lost this knowledge for centuries, though, what else might we have forgotten that's yet to be remembered? Next up, we have a unique piece of headgear. It's the war helmet of Mescalamdug, the feared and supremely powerful king of Kish, and the ruler of the first dynasty of Ur 4,600 years ago. There's a catch, though. We don't know if it belongs to the younger Mescalamdug or the older Mescalamdug. One was the grandson of the other, and both of them ruled over Akkad and Sumer. The grave of one of the two rulers was found in 1924 by Leonard Woolley, a British archaeologist of note. The helmet, along with many other fine burial goods, was found inside the grave. Woolley estimated that the grave's occupant was around 30 years old at the time of his death, which might point toward the younger Mescalamdung being the owner of the helmet. But being 30 didn't mean you couldn't be a grandfather in ancient times. The gold helmet is of a design that's only been found in the graves of two other people, Enatum and Sargon the Great. As both were kings of Kish, it seems likely that this was the equivalent of a crown. In a fascinating blend of art and functionality, a silver drinking cup in the shape of a fist crafted by the Hittites in central Turkey, is currently on display at the Museum of Fine Arts, Boston, USA. This unique artifact, dating back to around 1400 to 1380 BCE, likely during the reign of Tudhalias III, is a testament to the sophistication of Hittite craftsmanship. The cup's design, which evokes a Hittite hieroglyph meaning strength, is believed to have been used in rituals connected with the weather god Taruna. The frieze around the rim depicts Taruna holding a bull, and the great king Tudhalias leading priests and musicians from a city over a mountain, personified as a human figure covered with leaves. The cup's design is not only aesthetically pleasing, but also carries symbolic significance, possibly presented to the god to grant strength to the royal donor. This artifact raises intriguing questions about the concept of art in ancient cultures and the intentional creation of objects that blend practical use with artistic expression. So, as we marvel at this ancient, fist-shaped cup, we are reminded of the timeless human desire to infuse beauty and meaning into everyday objects. The Malia Pendant, also known as the Bees of Malia, is a stunning gold pendant dating back to the Minoan civilization manufactured somewhere around 1800 to 1650 BCE. This exquisite piece of jewelry was discovered in a tomb in Chrysolacos, Malia, Crete, in 1930. The pendant features two identical insects, possibly wasps or bees, joined head-to-head -head in a symmetrical arrangement. 
the insect's wings spread backwards, and from the lower edges of the wings and a point close to the tip of the abdomen dangle three discs. The insects appear to be grasping a centrally placed circular disc, and there is a second, smaller, smooth globule placed above this, as if they were eating it. The pendant is currently on display at the Heraklion Archaeological Museum on the island of Crete in Greece, and is considered one of the most famous pieces of Minoan jewelry. This artifact serves as a testament to the intricate craftsmanship and artistic prowess of the Minoan civilization. There's much that we don't know about them, but at least we can say with confidence that they were masters when it came to art. Standing within the rugged landscape of New Mexico, USA, the Crow Canyon petroglyphs are one of the most extensive collections of Navajo rock art in the American Southwest. Dating back to the 16th through the 18th centuries, these petroglyphs offer a glimpse into the rich cultural heritage of the Navajo people. Located in the remote Crow Canyon Archaeological District, the area holds significant historical importance as the traditional homeland of the Navajo, with their roots tracing back to as early as 1100. The intricate carvings, found predominantly on the canyon's south and east walls, depict a mesmerizing array of animals, humans, crops, weapons, and supernatural figures. Scholars speculate that these petroglyphs were likely connected to ceremonial practices, resembling Navajo ceremonial sand paintings. Interwoven among the Navajo art, you'll also discover older ancestral Puebloan rock art. Beyond the petroglyphs, the site features ancient Navajo ruins, known as Pueblitos, constructed during the 16th and 17th centuries. These are more than just relics. They're connections between the Navajo of the past and the Navajo of the present. Today, the Navajo tribe stands as the largest Native American tribe in the United States, with a thriving community of over 250,000 members. The Dendra Panoply is an artifact with an unusual name, so perhaps it would be more helpful if we referred to it as the Dendra Armor. This armor is quite unlike most ancient armor, though. It's a perfect example of a type of full-body armor that was specific to the Mycenaean era of more than 3,000 years ago. It's so named because it was found close to the village of Dendra in Argolid, Greece, in May 1960. The Swedish archaeologist responsible for the discovery said that the Dendra armor is the earliest example of beaten brass being used in body armor. Modern experts agree with them and think that the brass panels that made up the suit are around 3,500 years old. The armor would have been useful in that it would have provided reasonably adequate protection for the vital organs, but it would also have been uncomfortably heavy. The brass alone is quite a weight, but the leather thongs that held them together would have made the suit even heavier. Whoever wore the Dendra Panoply would have been covered from their neck to their knees, but they'd likely have had difficulties moving on the battlefield. The Tomb of Nefertiti, often referred to as the Sistine Chapel of Egypt, is renowned for housing some of Egypt's most well-preserved paintings. This tomb was built for Nefertiti, the first of the great royal wives of Ramses the Great. The paintings within the tomb are vibrant and detailed, providing a clear representation of what tombs and temples might have looked like during antiquity. The tomb of Nefertiti is distinguished by its extraordinary level of detail, surpassing other tombs found in the Valley of the Kings or the Valley of the Queens. It attracts plenty of visitors for obvious reasons, but those visitors should be aware that the cost to enter the tomb can be high, and time inside is typically limited to about 10 minutes. Having said that, the guards are generally lenient about this policy, especially if you're happy to slip them a banknote or a few coins to persuade them to look the other way. Despite the cost and time restriction, the opportunity to witness the remarkable artistry within the tomb of Nefertiti is well worth it. There's no tomb in Egypt quite like it. We finish in Turkey with the ancient site of Pinara, a settlement that was built at the foot of Mount Babadag. The people who lived here buried their dead in honeycomb-like tombs that were carved into the face of the cliff itself. Very little is known about the people who lived here. Most of our information about Pinara's residents comes from the writing of Manacrates, 
a Lycian historian who lived 2,400 years ago. According to him, Pinara was built because the town of Xanthos was becoming dangerously overpopulated, and so some of its residents had to be sent elsewhere. Some sources say that Alexander the Great conquered Pinara in 334 BCE, but there's some controversy about the claim. Attacking Pinara would surely be a waste of time for Alexander, because it was strategically unimportant and existed in a hard-to-reach remote location. Some of the inscriptions inside the tombs of Pinara are written in Lycian, but others are written in Greek, so the Greeks eventually came here whether that was under the leadership of Alexander or not. Phalli carved into the rocks in and around the tombs suggest that phallic worship may have happened here, but that can't be verified either. Subscribe to the channel and turn on notifications, and you will be the first to know when a new video comes out. Thank you for watching, and see you soon.